Welcome to this episode of CEO Perspectives, a signature series by the Conference Board. CEO Perspectives are conversations that take an objective, nonpartisan look at a range of subjects that matter most to business leaders. To help make sense of these topics, we sit down with thought leaders and do what we do best at the Conference Board, provide trusted insights for what's ahead. I'm Steve Odlin and the host of this podcast series. And in today's conversation, we're going to discuss the generations and in this podcast episode, specifically the silent generation. What makes this generation unique? In what ways is the silent generation like other generations and how are they different? And what are their views of other generations? You are listening to CEO Perspectives, a podcast by the Conference Board. Joining me today is Frank Muirs, a retired teacher and a member of the silent generation. Frank, welcome. Well, thank you, Steve. Glad to be here. I hope I can give you some great insights today. Well, I hope so, too, because you've got a lot of wisdom to share with us. But let's start with uh, your life and career. You know, obviously, that's hard to do in a couple minutes, but uh, you've had a brilliant teaching career and, and you know, very colorful life. Well, yeah, I think so. Born and raised in Minneapolis. Uh, My mom and dad both came off of a farm background. Second of six children uh, that came up through the just through through World War II and post World War II. Uh, High school locally, I went, uh, worked for the Star Tribune newspaper for four years, earned enough money to put myself through a private high school. Spent four years in the United States Navy, served in uh, naval air and uh, served on several naval air stations and an aircraft carrier. Uh, Came back, went to college at the University of Minnesota, got a two-year degree there and ended up at another university for a a BS degree and two MA degrees. I'm currently living in Plymouth, Minnesota, which is a suburb of Minneapolis. And I'm a father of three and a grandfather of four. So carrying on. That's all. And, you know, this whole generation thing is uh, is really interesting because, uh, you know, the first generation to really talk about it was the generation before you, which is the so-called greatest generation. I always find it interesting that the generation who started this named themselves the greatest. But um, and then so subsequent to your generation, which is called the silent generation, there's the boomers, there are the Xers, Y and Zers. So. Uh, a lot after you, you know, as you th- look at your generation, uh, what do you think characterizes the generation? Well, it may, maybe they call them silent because there just didn't seem to be a lot to to contribute at the time. The, the, the silent generation had just c- completed this great thing called World War II. And the follow-up was, was actually a storm of what was happening internationally and nationally. The, UN was coming to board and, and people were talking and and people were going back to work and transportation was all screwed up and and the building boom was coming up. So we were silent for a reason, but we were optimistic. I think I think everybody that I grew up with was optimistic that we were now in a, in a kind of a new era that somehow now that we the bad guys are all gone away, we can now build this great world and, and everybody will be educated. There won't be the, these non-educated people. We'll all have at least a high school. And most of them, we thought at that time, would be college educated as well. So that was our, our outlook. I thought we were quite optimistic. And, of course, it didn't take long before Korea showed up and, and then Vietnam, which uh, made our outlook of, of peace in our time uh, a little more shaky than we would have liked. Yeah, but, you know, it's it, even though, you know, you were born in the Great Depression. I don't know what was so great about it. It was a it was a bad uh, depression. But and so even though you know you really didn't live your adult life in that your your life was colored by that because your parents and your family around you had to survive that and the wars. And so talk about how all of that colored your generation. My mom and dad, the gener- the the, the so called great generation or great. Uh, whatever they uh, they had fewer opportunities. They came up in an agrarian society here in Minnesota. They came off the farm, and pretty much it was expected from them to simply get a job, work, and that was it. Either you stayed on the farm and you farmed, or you somehow you found a job in the 
in the nearest town or city and and you stayed with it and that was a thing that the fact that everything was straight ahead and and on with it and we were able to at least think a little more laterally than that we we, we would think that uh, all this stuff was over and we probably wouldn't have to relive this kind of of uh, thing again we would never see this particular type of of interaction in our society that we had experienced uh, we were a little naive but <laughs> here you are so you know the, the interesting that you called it a job you know and it's really interesting because you either stay on the farm and you you know you work to live or you come off the farm and you get a job. You didn't say a career, which yes. is, you know, the way generations after that. Talk about that distinction between job and career, because that that was really the attitude. Yeah, I don't think I ever heard the word career, nor did anyone ever when I was between the ages of what I can remember in 18 or 20 even, that um, encouraging education. You, you've got to get a better education. You've got to do better than I did, da, da, da. You simply... Uh, you took a job. And I think my dad was a perfect example. He walked the streets till he found a job. And when he got a job, he stayed with it. You didn't leave. He stayed there the rest of his life until they forced him out at 65. And I think that was not atypical at all. I think that was many, many people. How did you become this? Well, I showed up one day and I worked in a warehouse forever. I, I filled milk bottles. I drove a truck over there. I did this. It wasn't that they sat down. I don't remember ever hearing the word career planning. And when I went to school, you simply uh, you got out and you prepared yourself and you got out there and you got a job and you got it done. Yeah. And, and, and that was important because it was all self-reliance, right? I mean, there wasn't a view that you could rely necessarily on the government, although there were programs, um, some programs in place and some put in place later. But but the intent was, you know, you, you know, you eat what you kill, you go to work and, you know, you make whatever you make in order to feed yourself, feed your family and care for them. It was that, so that's a, just a different attitude, huh? Sure. And you, in part, what you, what, what you have, you, you pass on what you what you bring to the table and what they brought was a worth a work ethic that was unmatched. It was simply, that's the way it was done. And that's what they instilled in their kids that, we suffered through this. We didn't always have enough to eat. We didn't always have enough to, to, to wear. And my dad dropped about being the oldest of 11 that he had to, he had some, never had boots for his, his feet to go to school. And one day it just became easier not to go and he didn't. So he only went to sixth grade. Um, so the expectations were, were more of a survival uh, type of outlook and I guess if you came one through the 29 uh, they were born they went through a, at least partially through World War I the Great Depression World War II they did not really experience this great outpouring of, uh, of wealth and uh, the American dream they just didn't you survived you survived and you got a job if you were lucky. I mean, you know, they came from the Great Depression where there were 25 percent unemployment. So getting a job was a big deal. Now, you know, the silent generation uh, covers birth years 1928 to 1945. And so you're sitting kind of mid uh, midway through that. What do you see? Any differences in the generation of those who are on the front end versus the back end of that generation, your generation? Yeah, I, I, I think I think that's uh, I do, because the earlier ones would have been, let's say you're born in 1928, 29. Again, you're an infant, but nevertheless, you're introduced into that society that's at that time very needy. And you maybe uh, didn't get all you wanted or needed. So they was they came out of a depression. Things things were looking down. And you could Maybe maybe World War II bailed us out of that, but but by the end of World War II, which is kind of where we ended up, uh, forty five, things were looking up. Um, economically, things had had gone; they couldn't get any worse. They were now looking up, and in by the by forty five, well, it was a little early in forty five, but certainly you knew what was going to happen in forty six through fifty. There's a boom and. Transportation, you couldn't buy a car in 1944 or 1945, but you can now, and it's going to look like this, and it's wonderful, and houses are going up, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do that. And, this, and there's such a thing called the suburbs arose. So even though we were maybe only 12 years or even less behind that first group, 
I think we were really dramatically different. Yeah. You know, this. you, you mentioned that the word suburb, it, it, and you started this by talking about coming from an agrarian society to the to, to an urban society, there really weren't suburbs in, for your generation or the generation before. It was either the farm or the city. And, and I'm not sure that subsequent generations really understand how different those two are, you know, were to the generations and the lives that came out of that. Well, it's true. You simply, if you lived outside the city, you probably worked uh, for a farm, an uh, agricultural entity of some kind particularly up here in the upper Midwest, where, the, where at that time, we were probably 80% uh, of our people outside the metro area were, were considered farm people. So, um, yeah, city farm was completely different than it is now, where the city sprawls out. You've got the megalops, you've got the, the big cities going way, way out, and people, and, and because of transportation and communication, um, things were just plain more isolated, more shrunk, more, more uh, interaction within themselves and so forth. So they didn't really get out. They, and it didn't allow for the, for the bursting forth of new energies, which brought, up, which brought changes. Of course, World War II brought many, many changes, but some of those, at least some of those, were participated by the ability to kill each other. There was new advances in that, as, as we will see it happens in every generation. Now, the, the, the other aspect was education, and you spent your life as a teacher. You characterized yourself as a master teacher, and meaning, you know, this is something that you were serious about. And you This was your career, and you were dedicated to it, and you were very good at it. But education in the generation before you and, and to, you know, a large extent in your generation is was viewed differently, and it was sort of optional uh, to some extent, particularly, as you mentioned, your dad only went through the sixth grade, but it was it was it was viewed as optional. That all changed, and there became a requirement in most areas of the country, anyway, that uh, you know high school had to be provided, and that was expected. And then later college. So talk about that evolution. Well, the expectations, uh, I think, is set by the in many cases by the, the family first, and then by the by the culture or by the community. Um, so it depends on how, how ingrained you are in your society and your family. I really, in, in a lot of respects, had no expectations put out for me. They didn't say, we want you to do this, we want you to do that. But I knew, I knew for sure that I, I wanted to do better. I wanted to go beyond sixth grade. My mom actually went to graduate from high school, which was rare and back in the 1920s. She had to take a train into the big city from this small town. and. Uh, and she had to work for a, a family. She became their live-in uh, maid, if you will. And um, so, so she had her own expectation, but the people, she was actually looked down on by many of the people in the small community who thought she's just a little bit uppity that she went to the city and then got herself a degree in that high school degree, oh, and blah, blah, blah. And her father actually resented that. And he did that, I think, till the day he died, that she had, she had left home and, and gone to almost abandoned their way of life. But, but uh, she had to go live with another family and work almost full time as a caretaker of the house and the children in order to then put herself through high school. I mean, it was it, it was it, an enormous feat, you know, from that small town that is now a suburb of uh, of the big city. That's right. And she was and there were and there were things we just don't even think about the fact that and I've asked her that, and she said, you know, I said, did you think you had options about raising a family, of, of having five or six kids? And she said, no. Yeah. She did. They not only had the pressure of, of the society, they also had the pressure of a church, which is a, another thing they, their particular church believed in. You know, we don't do birth control. We, uh, da, 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 da. And it, it created a, a, uh, an environment that, that they became a victim of. Yeah, so there's these uh, societal pressures and expectations that define that generation and spilled over into your generation that, that subsequent generations just, you know, now view as optional. They they have choices that weren't that weren't viewed as choices back in your generation. That's right. 
So there a lot of events happened um, during the course of your generation as well. Talk about the, you know, I'm thinking about historical events, uh, global events. Talk about the ones that, that as you know, you look back over the course of your life that were most, most meaningful, impactful in your life. Well, there, there's, there's almost too many to name. I mean, holy cow. But uh, uh, one thing I wanted to mention is that I think, my dad would say, you know, this present generation, meaning me, was they're lazy, they're no good. Da, da, da. And I hear that all the time about millennials. Yeah, and then you hear about the boomers. Yeah, boomer. Yeah, yeah. We, we had a, I think we had a great, a great generation. I mean, we, where, where, would you, where do you want to start? I mean, post-war came uh, the United Nations. Uh, post-war came uh, such things as, um, well, Vietnam, which changed changed the American and the, and the marches and the way we changed, changed the country and what we demanded of our government. Uh, and we went into some more crisis. We had the riots in Chicago in 1968. Martin Luther King got shot. Robert Kennedy got shot. We saw the voting right legislation, the, the LBJ, the Great Society, civil rights marches, civil rights amendments, voting rights amendments. And by the end of the 60s, we put a man on the moon. Now, who could figure that with the primitive uh, computers that we had we were able to do that by 93 we saw the internet by oh right after the war perhaps the very first thing we didn't even know that we were in was the atomic age great turning point in history collapse of the soviet union the cold war we only had 48 states we picked up two new ones i think about 1969 um, just lots and lots of things like that. Title IX, women's rights. There's a, there's just a, a litany of, of major things that had happened. Uh, pick up your cell phone. That, that didn't exist. I would think that my generation would, I would hope that we would be judged on the fact that we were a, a human rights generation, that we, we stood up and fought for things that, that we, we tolerated before. So that we actually, in my lifetime, know that people couldn't go. And I experienced that with my travels in the South. You could not go in certain restaurants. You could not drink out of certain fountains. You couldn't even be with another a U.S. Navy sailor in, in a bus depot. I experienced that being threatened with arrest and so forth and so on. Being harassed by the highway patrol in Mississippi. Things that, that today you go, what? That can't happen. And uh, I uh, got into... Uh, semi-serious trouble on, on the, when, when a Mississippi Highway Patrolman said to me, y'all a Yankee, ain't you? And I said, no, I don't play baseball. And that was the wrong answer. As part of the <laughs> but, yeah, um, you were a smart aleck, weren't you? Well, I just figured, I said, you, you have no right to stop me. And he said, well, we can do it here out in the highway. We can do it in town. Yeah. I had already yeah, know. Different, uh... D different era you know the other area another area that that evolved i mean just dramatically you touched on it but technology i mean when when you were born you know the means of communication was a hard line telephone and and it was shared a lot of times there were party lines you know such a thing that you, nobody knows what that is anymore and in the radio but nothing else no we had a phone but we couldn't use it as children we couldn't use it we were limited to 40 calls per month um and we were just simply weren't allowed to use the phone. If you wanted to talk to your friend, you went to their house. You, you, you called for them, as we said. And you don't even hear that term anymore. We, you went out in their backyard and you yelled their name. And if they were home, they came out. And if they weren't, they didn't. So, so you, you really hung, <laughs> kept you in your neighborhood, I'll tell you that. <laughs> you, didn't, you texted a no, and there's no such thing. That perhaps is, is something we're going to find every generation could say. Boy, when we came on, you know, they didn't, uh, chemotherapy, man, do you believe they used to give you medicine that would actually kill you? I mean, I mean in 50 years from now, they're going to go, I can't believe that. Well, it happened. We actually, here's what we did. And they're going to just, just, mm, my, that's terrible. I don't think as a generation, I don't hear my peers. I certainly don't criticize the other generations. I, I've heard people rip on the millennials and all that. I taught for 41 years, and, I, and almost every year I'd look at these kids out there in the, in the seats, and I'd say, if that's, our, if that's our future, I'm okay with it, because there are some marvelous people out there, horribly. They were motivated way beyond I, where I was. And uh, one of my goals in, as a teacher was the fact that I always said, 
I'm going to make sure that they have an experience that I didn't have. And because we were in overstuffed schools and undereducated teachers in a, in, a, in a Catholic school, and it was simply not that great of a situation. And here I could provide for them and give them hope and guarantee them success, which is sounds like a, a cliche. It sounds like maybe this is not realistic, but it, it is realistic. So I could sit in my advanced math class and say to these kids, there's no such thing as failure unless you choose that. If you do not choose that, take it off the table because it's not going to happen. We're going to get you through in just great shape. Yeah, and education has become the the great equalizer in this country. If if you if you you know grab it and you go at it, and so your it's interesting how you you position it. But you know your career and it was a, a dedication actually to future generations because you were investing yourself and everything you had in in what kids at that stage you know whatever every everybody younger than us is called a kid but but kids in a, in in middle school I, and, and but that was an investment that you were making and and if they were willing to work and do the work and and invest their time and take it seriously they anything could happen right yeah and you know what i think a lot of the things that we experienced as younger people let's say between the ages of 15 and 35 were thrust on us, this type of change, this type of thing, this came down the pike, this is what you had to do, this is what you had to do. And, and, and particularly when you're young in your career and you're just starting out, you, you know, your, your choices are completely different. We were not too much unlike my dad in the fact that he chose to get a job and survive. We chose to get an education and survive and to work and work and work and work and work. We didn't have a lot of time to put into some of the things that I would have liked to to put more time into, including the civil rights marchers and so forth. But I would think if I had defined my generation as something, I would, I would like to define it to other people as the ones that, that, that and I mean, this word is scary, but we woke up, we woke. We, we decided that, hey, the planet is being used and abused, and it's high time that we listen to them, some of our Native American friends here in Minnesota, that they'd say things like, you cannot own the earth. It's mother earth. And we you certainly can never own that. And we share that environment and you cannot use it, abuse it, and nature put it back. You either take care of it, you nurture it, or you will destroy that. And if you destroy it, mother earth, you destroy yourself. Yeah. So they can hopefully we're the ones that are focusing people in on a little bit more on that today then we got to do some things here you've talked uh you know a bit about the generation before you the greatest so-called greatest generation and you've characterized you know your view of of that generation when you look at the generations that followed you so uh directly after your generation was the baby boom generation and then it went into generation x generation y which is millennials and generation z and the babies being born today are generation alpha i guess they're starting it all over again so but when you look at those younger generations you know think of it at x y and z do you see differences you know, between those generations or, you know, they're all younger. Do they all kind of look the same and run together for you? You know, they, they all have the same characteristics. And the fact that we always look, we look at the others and think, well, we're better than that, at least. Um, but having raised some kids that were Gen Xers, um, I think they're more laid back. They're, 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 although they're educated and they, and they have great jobs and stuff. They, they, I think I was more, more driven. Oh, you can't do that. I got to get straight ahead. Boom. Let's get this done. And I'm still like that. No, don't put that aside. Let's get this done. I'm not going to set that aside. And my Gen X kids go, yeah, whatever. You know, we can do that. Let's do it tomorrow. I don't know. I'm going to get around to that. Maybe next year. And and the other ones, the very much younger ones, I don't, I'm here the terms like they're lazy, they're less capable, they don't want to work. I don't particularly ascribe that to them, although they have the with the, all the people that have kind of quit, they say, eh, we have a society that have given them that option. If we took that option away, or nature does, or the world does, they will then make different decisions. I think people are basically the same. We all tend to be a little optimistic, a little pessimistic. Mm -hmm. If you look back over the course of your life, um, 
obviously you can't change history and and your life is history every day before this but you know would there have been something that you would have done different in your life yeah i'd have matured earlier um, <laughs> sign me up for that too <laughs> in some respects we had to mature uh, quickly i mean i got out of school i left home never looked back but, and, I, and i didn't have a problem with that at all weren't you ever homesick no i wasn't i not like I didn't miss him, I suppose, but I just wasn't. Um, I don't know. We we went on, and uh, and, and we were uh, we were dedicated. And I think initially to ourselves, and again, I think that's a that's probably uh, universal of all the generations. You're much more into yourself and the things you're doing. We didn't do the some of the things my Gen Xers do. We never went to concerts and all that sort of thing. First off, we didn't have a disposable income like they seem to have today. And uh, that makes a huge difference. So um, as you well know, economic and cultural differences make a, a huge uh, difference in, in we, the, the outcomes. So would I do something different? One of the things I hear older people say, and I think we're going to, we're, I'm sorry to say it now, is that we were born in a really good time. We really had a lot of good things. We did have the American dream. We were able to realize it. We worked our way up, we made the best of it. This was a good time. And I think as people age, they look back, they say, yeah, I grew up in the 50s. I grew up in the 70s. Oh yeah, I grew up in the 90s. Great time. You make your great times, you know? They, uh, they come and they go, but uh, they, uh, so much of our, our focus, if you turn on the news too much, is, is on the types of success, the economic things, the things that they deem success, uh, as you mature, you no longer uh, label as success. Yeah. So. so you make your great time at really, really wise words. So last question, you know, when you, when people look back on the silent generation, let's just go out a hundred years. I mean, you know, so it's far enough in it, it behind the period that people could look at it a little more objective. When they look back a hundred years from now, what will they say about the silent generation? They'd probably say we're too silent. <laughs> I think I think we initiated a, a, uh, an era of of awareness, uh, not just of of human rights. Although you can still see on the screen every day that that we still haven't attained a lot of those areas. So the human rights issues and the and the uh, the awareness of our world that our world is not a planet. It's not a piece of real estate that goes from here to the suburbs. It's not. Our world is all of us together on this third rock, if you will. And we either survive or we die as a group. And I don't think a lot of people quite see that yet. You might be economically somewhere else or you're very poor or whatever you are, but somehow we're in this together. We're in the same lifeboat and uh, you either roll or you die. Great words of wisdom. Frank Muir, thanks for joining us today. Hey, it's a pleasure. and. Uh, Call on me anytime. Thanks a lot. Good to see you. And thanks to all of you for listening in to CEO Perspectives. Every week, I'll be joined by a prominent thought leader to provide insights on the issues of our time. We'll cover the leading topics in geopolitics, economics, public policy, and more. Please share CEO Perspectives with your colleagues, with your friends, with your family of all generations. I know they're going to want to listen. I'm Steve Odlin, and this series has been brought to you by the Conference Board. You have been listening to CEO Perspectives, a podcast by the Conference Board.